be taking out your Bibles and turning to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, and you might want to put a marker there, as we'll be spending a lot of time in Acts chapter 4 this evening. In the passage that was just read for us from Acts chapter 4, here, as Peter and, uh, Peter and John are being questioned by those of the Sanhedrin, by, the, by those that are here, the Jewish leaders questioning them, the Sanhedrin asked them by what power and name they had healed this man, and then Peter gives this answer to them in verses 8 through 12. And then in verse 13, this statement is made. That when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. You know, the reaction here of the Jewish leaders to Peter and John and to Peter's response to them is that they could tell that Peter and John had been with Jesus. Well, I want us to think about that statement tonight, and I want us to think about this text for just a few moments this evening. And to think about this idea of they had been with Jesus. Before we talk about what led to that statement being made, I want us to think for just a second about the background to this story. We're looking here in Acts chapter 4 at this questioning that's going on, but I want us to think going back into back into chapter 3 for just a moment, and what all is going on around this statement that is made here in Acts chapter 4. Now, in Acts chapter 3 is where Peter and John had healed a lame man. If you go into chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, is when Peter and John went together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain, lame, uh, a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they daily, who lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms for those who entered the temple. And as you go through this text, as he comes to them, he's begging of them, and he asks them for something. As he fixed his eyes on him with Peter, or John, and Peter said, Look at us, as this man is asking and begging alms in verse 3, So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them, in verse 5. Peter told to him that silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. So in this text here, in chapter 3, in the background of this text, this is where Peter and John have healed this lame man. And they're going through here and the verses that follow through the temple. And everybody sees him. And they knew, verse 10 of Acts 3, that this man that is here with Peter and John, is the man that lay daily at the, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled, verse 10, with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran to gather to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So the people come to gather, and, and, and they look here at what has taken place, and they are just in awe. They are amazed. Here's a man who, by the way, was not just lame, but lame from his mother's womb. And now he's healed. He's a grown man. Here he, here he is healed. And the fact that something marvelous has been done cannot be denied. Here he stands before them. Here he's running and leaping. A man that not a few moments earlier couldn't even walk. And they're amazed. And as they're amazed there, Peter responds to them by giving his, what we refer to as his second sermon. We think of Acts chapter 2 being the first sermon, Acts 3, that's Peter's second sermon. The second sermon recorded for us in scriptures that he gives. And beginning at verse 12, he said, it says, So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? 
The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified His servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when He was determined to let Him go. What Peter tells them is, we didn't do this in verses 12 through 18. It was the power of Jesus that did. He told them, don't look at us and think that we're so great that it was by our own godliness or by our own power this man was healed. This was done by Jesus. It's by His power. And His name, through faith in His name, He has made this man, verse 16, strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through Him has given Him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. He says it was Jesus that healed him. And Jesus, this Jesus whom was crucified, who they d denied in the presence of Pilate, or was delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, he had already pointed out in verse 13. So, verse 19, what you need to do is repent and be converted. He said, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before. So what he tells them here, only the first part of uh, uh, 19 through the first part of verse 21 is, in light of what you've seen taking place, and the fact that this man is healed because of Jesus whom you crucified, you need to repent and be converted. And then he points out to them that the Old Testament prophets had pointed to Christ, the Christ whom they had crucified, the one that he told them to repent and turn towards. In the latter half of verse 21, which God has spoken by the mouth of His holy prophets since the world began. He pointed out in verse 21, or verse 20, that it was in Jesus who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. And that was foretold and spoken of by the Old Testament prophets. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets, from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed, or in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. He tells him, he told him, Jesus is the one that healed him. It's by the power of Jesus whom you crucified. So you need to repent and be converted because this is the one the Old Testament prophet spoke of. Moses said there would be a prophet like him. In verse 22, this is the one you should turn to. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with our fathers and Abraham. And when he said, and in, your, and in your seed all families of the earth will be blessed. And he says that they need to realize that, that Christ was sent first to bless them in turning away every one of them from their iniquities. Well, as this sermon is being preached by Peter, and as they're speaking to the people, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them in chapter 4 and in verse 1. And they were greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached Jesus, the resurrection from, in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. So they laid hands on them and put them, verse 3, into custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of them came to be about 5,000. So here they come and they see Peter and John preaching Jesus. Well, can't have them preaching Jesus. So they take them and bring them into prison. Take them into prison. We're not going to let them preach in the name of Jesus. And so they take them away to, 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 for the next day, to hold them into custody until the next day since it's already late. Now the good news is in verse 4, a great many people still believe the message that Peter and John had preached. Despite the fact, and maybe it helped the fact that the Jewish leaders were so opposed to Jesus. But the Jewish leaders take them and put them in prison. And then verse... Five beginning is where that discussion begins taking place as to what as to what leads up to this statement being made. When in verse seven they ask, "By what power or by what name have you done this?" And that is where we get the answer that was given by 
Peter that led to them saying they perceived that they had been with Jesus. Now this is the background to this statement and what leads up to this questioning taking place. But let's talk about the reason or how they knew that, that Peter and John had been with Jesus. Well, there's two things we want to point out. And it's because of the first that the second was so amazing. The first is, they realized these were uneducated and untrained men. That is, the apostles were not considered, at least, some, at least some of them, the majority of them, not considered educated by the world standards. For all, Peter and John were fishermen. Those wouldn't be considered the most highly educated of the day. So here are those that by the world standards are not considered educated. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, remember in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 7, on the day of Pentecost, when they saw that all those that were speaking with Galileans, they supposed they must have been drunk. They didn't think there was any way that the Galileans could speak in so many different languages in Acts chapter 2. They perceived they must have been drunk. Now, I don't still, I've, I've never understood that. Normally when you're drunk, you don't become smarter, but that's what they thought of the apostles in Acts chapter 2. They must have been drunk because here they are speaking in tongues they didn't know, and these, these are Galileans. Galileans were not considered educated. A lot of people do not consider, the Galileans were not considered the educated of the people. Yet, in spite of that, in spite of the fact that they're considered uneducated and untrained, in spite of the fact that by world standards, they, they just are not as intelligent as those sitting before them on the Sanhedrin Council, they were bold. That's really what leads to this statement, or to this thought by the Jewish leaders. If you look again in verse 13 of Acts 14, it said that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived they were uneducated and untrained, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. The first reaction by those there was to marvel at the fact that here are men so bold, yet not educated by the world's standards. After all, why is he so bold in answering those that he used before? Why is he so bold in answering the religious leaders? So bold in answering the Sanhedrin Council? Well... Their perception is they had been with Jesus. Because we already talked about the Sanhedrin is questioning them. They just ask in verses 5 through 7, questioning them. In verse 7 specifically, by what power or by what name have you done this? What they did was they challenged them. Present to us by where you got the authority and the power to heal this man. How did you do it? By what authority? By what name have you healed this man? They, they probably had to already know the answer where they were going to be given, considering they came upon them preaching Jesus. And they took them and brought them in to question them. They asked them, by what power or name have you done this? And that is when Peter turns around and gives his answer that is so bold that they perceived that they had been with Jesus. Well, what is the answer that he gave? What answer is given by Peter in this text that leads them to believe that they had been with Jesus? Well, number one, the first thing they do is they sort of turn the tables back on, uh, on the Sanhedrin council. Here he's being questioned. By what name or by what power have you done this? And his reply in verse 8 is, or verse 9 is, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, he'll go on to give the answer later on as to how that is done. But he begins by pointing out what you're doing is you're questioning us about a good deed done to a helpless man. Should have been great cause for rejoicing by those there. Here's this man that's been lame from birth. Here's this man that cannot, cannot walk, and now he can. And, you're, and, and Peter's... Saying, putting there saying, listen, you're sitting here questioning us how this is done. Why? Think about it today. If somebody, not even a miracle involved, just somebody goes to a doctor and gets good results, we are so glad that they got good results. Everybody's so glad. Good, they've got good results on their test. 
What they should have been doing is, here's this man that hasn't been able to walk, and now he is. Good. That's great. This lame man can now walk. He no longer has to be a beggar. But instead, instead, they want to know, by what power or name did you do this? They're questioning how it was done. But that wasn't what really led to the boldness, to them perceiving the, or seeing this boldness in them. It's really the next three verses and the three things pointed out in those that lead to them seeing how bold they are. The first is, he points out that this deed was done by Jesus whom they had crucified. Look at verse 10. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you hold. Now as the people shout out, crucify, crucify with the Lord. And they stand there and they're putting, wanting him to be put to death. Well, the Jews couldn't actually put him to death. They had made it so fixed that they got it to Pilate and Pilate turned it over to the Jews. Technically, the Jews weren't supposed to put anybody to death because they were under the Romans. But they go to Pilate, and Pilate washes his hands of the situation and tells him, you do with him what you see fit. And they take and they crucify him. They cry out, crucify, crucify him. Instead, they want Barabbas to be released, an insurrectionist and a murder. They want him released so they can put to death Jesus because of the hatred they had for him. Now you think about that and the hatred they possess towards Jesus. And the fact that Peter here doesn't just say, well, it was done by Jesus. He so boldly says, it was done by Jesus, and he points the finger at them whom you crucified. He points the finger at them and says, it's done by the man whom you put on that cross. It's done by him. It's by Jesus. Not only did you crucify him, by the way, he comes down and points out in verse 11 that he's the stone which was rejected by the builders. Look at verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. It's a quotation from 118th Psalm in verse 22 that says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now, sort of as a side note, this tells me something, by the way, that the Bible is its own best commentary for just as sort of as a side note here, that it tells us in, in Psalm 118 that the stone was rejected by the builders, and Peter tells us here who the stone is and who the builders are. He says, Jesus is that stone, and you builders rejected that stone. You religious leaders rejected that stone, yet he's become the, corner, the chief cornerstone. Or the building of anything, uh, and, and the building of something with stone, that cornerstone is all important because if you take out that cornerstone there, everything else is just sort of going to crumble around it. And here's the one that the religious leaders should have been looking to. Here's the one the religious leaders should have been following. They should have been the ones that saw the signs that this truly is the Messiah. But they rejected it. They were the builders who thought he wasn't a sufficient enough stone, if you will, as, the, as Psalm 118 is pointing out. And instead, the stone they rejected wasn't just any old stone. It was the chief cornerstone, the very foundation, the very thing holding all else together. And Peter points the finger at them again and says, you crucified him. You rejected him. In verse 12, Yet he's the only one in whom there is salvation. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter points out to them then that not only have they rejected him, not only did they crucify him, but he is the only way in which they can ever be saved. He is the only way to have salvation. There is no other name given among men by which you must be saved. That's what Peter tells them here. Is he says, you're judging us for a good deed. You, but the deed that was done was not done by us, but by Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus whom you rejected. Him in whom there is, is the only one, the only name in which there is salvation. By the way, there's your answer. By what name or what power have you done this? 
His reply, we did it by the only name in which there is salvation. And then they marvel in verse 13 because of the boldness of Peter and John. And they perceive that they had been with Jesus. Now that's the story, the background and how they knew that Peter and John had been with Jesus. But you know, others can see Christ living in us. Others can see Christ in us. While we may not physically be standing there with Jesus, then somebody may make the statement today, if they had seen us today, they'd see they'd been with Jesus. Or they can see Christ living in them. That person is a Christian because of the manner of life in which they live. The way that we live our life can reflect Christ. Remember Paul said, it is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. In Galatians chapter 2. And so we ought to be reflecting that. And so when others look at us, they can say, we see Christ living in them. So a few things for us to consider in a few moments that remain this evening. One of those is, we need to realize that others see Jesus living in us. That again, we proclaim Him by how we live. How we live, others can look and say, that person's a Christian. Or maybe that person's not a Christian. But we need to make sure that others see Christ in us. So we need to be in a situation, in the circumstance where those that know us, not that, there may be people that pass us that may be able to tell something is different. But those that, that know us to at, at least a decent extent, can tell that there's something different about us. There's something different. They're not like everybody else. Remember, we're called upon to be holy, separate apart, distinct. That's why we stand out to those in the world. But I want us to think about some ways that we do that. Some ways that others see Christ living in us. We do that by, first and foremost, how we dress. Think about Proverbs chapter 7 and in verse 10. Proverbs chapter 7 and in verse 10. And there was a woman, and there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. First Timothy chapter 2, they were told to dress in a way that is modest and with propriety. It said, In like manner women are like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation. Not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. You know the way we dress says something about us? That again is why in Proverbs chapter 7 and in verse 10, there's what is referred to as the attire of a harlot. When they look at it, they could tell that person was hard. You know, whether we realize it or not, we do that a lot of times in the world today. If you walk through the grocery store and you pass somebody in scrubs, you probably figure it's a doctor or a nurse, probably a nurse. You pass somebody in a police uniform, you think, well, that person's a police officer. Same thing with paramedics, so on and so forth. You pass people in the uniform, you think, well, that must be their profession, right? That's what they do for a living because of how they dress. Well, keep in mind that we're called upon to be Christians. As Christians, we're workers, Sometimes we refer to it as a vacation Bible school, but I heard uh, my dad say one time, it's not a vacation, Christianity is not a vacation, it's a vocation. It's our calling, it's our job. You think about that, that if everybody else's vocation, when they have a uniform, is professed by the uniform they wear, our vocation, our, our job of being Christians, the work that we do as a Christian, should be such that the way we dress reflects that. That when others look at us, they think, they're different. They dress different. There's something different about them. Why is it they don't dress like everybody else dresses? And when they look at it, they can perceive that must be a Christian. Somebody that's trying to live a manner pleasing to God. Not only is that shown by how we dress, that's shown by how we talk. We talk differently than other people do. In Colossians chapter 4 and in verse 6, it said, to let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is telling them there, in Ephesians chapter 4, 
that they need to, about some things they need to put away to be the new man. In chapter 4, beginning at verse 17, he talks about the new man. You put off the old, you're not like the Gentiles, uh, down through verse 23. But in 24, you put on the new man created in God's likeness. And so verse 25, here's the first thing he says, put away lying. That's, that's how you talk. People, when they find out you're lying, they're going to think, well, that's just like everybody else. Everybody talks about, everybody lies. It's just a little white lie. No, if you're being honest with somebody, and they, they realize you're being honest with them, and they realize you're not lying, then it's, it's going to stand out. In verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Again, if we're not letting the corrupt words proceed out of our mouth, the things which he pointed out in this text, the Gentiles do, then people are going to look at us and think, well, there's something different about them. In chapter 5 and in verse 4, no foolish talk nor coarse jesting. But instead we're saying things which are fitting, rather the, but rather the giving of thanks. Not the things which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. No, again, you don't talk like the world talks. Not making those foolish jokes, those coarse jesting or crude joking as some translations say. But instead they look and think, that person's different. You know what you say and how you say it can make a big difference in how people perceive you. And when people realize you don't talk like the rest of the world talks, you don't talk like the, everybody else may in the workplace, or everybody else at school, or everybody else wherever you may be talks, that you're different. They'll perceive that something is different. And they can realize that you are serving Jesus. Just like when they, when they looked at Peter and John, the Sanhedrin did, they said they have been with Jesus. And it stood out. People can do that and we can proclaim Christ by what we say. You know, but we can also be proclaiming Christ and, and others may perceive that we're Christians by the things that we don't do. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verses 3 and 4, Peter lists there in chapter 3, he said they spent a lot, enough of their past life in, in, in doing the will of the Gentiles. That is, doing what the rest of the world is doing. Walking in lewdness and lust, and drunkenness and revelries, and drinking parties and abominable idolatries. And he said in verse 4, that in regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. You know, when they look at you, when those of the world look at you and they think, well, why aren't you partaking in the things we're partaking in? That long list there and many others that the world partakes in. They think it's strange. What's, what's so different about you? Now, in the case of 1 Peter 4, here were those that had spent their past life in doing those things. But even today, people may look at us and think, why is it that you won't do the things that the rest of us do? Why is it that you don't fit in with the rest of us? The answer ought to be because we're Christians. And when they look at us and they realize, you know, they don't want to partake in the things that we do. The lewdness, the lust, the drunkenness, the revelries, the drinking parties, the abominable idolatries, and many other things. That they realize that here's somebody that's serving God. They may perceive that you're a Christian. That you're a faithful servant of God. Just as the Sanhedrin perceived that Peter and John had been with Jesus. But you know, you can also proclaim Him by how you are in your family relationships. I think this is something that we often forget about. But the fact is, how one is in their family relationships, it does first and foremost in fact, affect one's salvation. Because prayers can be hindered, as 1 Peter 3, 7 points out. But it also can set an example for everybody else. In 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, is dealing with uh, wives being submissive to their husbands. That even if some of them don't obey the word, they may without a word be won by the conduct of their wives. We'll come back and talk about that part later on. But when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your uh, adornment be merely outward, the arranging of hair, wearing of gold, or, or, or putting on fine apparel, similar to what Paul said in that passage in 1 Timothy 2. But, but rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And that, For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. 
What he tells wives here is, you need to conduct yourselves as God would have you, even when your husband's not what he ought to be. You may win him by your conduct. Well, you know, what she realizes is, she's proclaiming that I'm living my life in service to God, no matter what you're doing. If a husband dwells with his wife with understanding, giving honor to her as to the weaker vessel, and as heirs together the grace of life, their prayers are not hindered, as verse 7 points out. But as other people see them, they may realize, you know what, there's something different about that. We live in a society, particularly in which television has flipped and twisted the family rules. And you turn on a television show, and just about every father painted on there uh, can't think straight, and every woman is uh, not submissive to the husband, and every child is running the home. That's the painted picture on television for the most part today. That's how society paints it today. They don't want to have the roles that were those specific roles assigned in Scripture. That's outdated stuff. And so when the world sees you living as God has said in His will in your family relationships, they perceive something must be different. These must be Christians. They have to realize that you're doing something different than everybody else because you're a servant of God. Oh, some may call you outdated. Some may say that's the old way of thinking. But the fact is that God's Word is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's not outdated thinking, it's God's will. And if one is what they ought to be in the family relationships, and others see that and take note of that, they can realize that person is a Christian. Just as the Sanhedrin perceived that Peter and John had been with Jesus. Now let's talk just real briefly about the result of others seeing Christ in us, and then we'll bring this lesson to a close this evening. What's the result of that? In the case here, in Acts chapter 4, they perceived they had been with Jesus. They questioned them a little further. And Peter said that, you know, whether we ought to obey God rather than man, you judge. But we cannot help but speak the things that we have heard. And they're sent away. So don't preach any more in the name of Jesus and they're sent away. They come back in chapter 5 and they're questioned again. And that time they're sent away again because of the advice of Gamaliel in chapter 5. But as they're brought in their question, they're sent away by the Jewish leaders. But the Jewish leaders told them, don't speak anymore in the name of Jesus. That was what happened there. But they perceived they had been with Jesus. And they perceived the impact the teaching could have by these men that had been with Jesus. Well, when others perceive today that we are living as we're reflecting Christ, that Christ lives in us, as Paul said that he did in him in Galatians 2, What's the result of that? Well, the result first and foremost is we set an example. Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. In Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16, it talks about being the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth, verse 13. But if a salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men? You are, verse 14, the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, we're, we're, we're the salt. Uh, he points out in verse 13. But verse 14, he uses the illustration of light. Now, I want you to think about that illustration for just a second. Because that really captures the idea of others perceiving we had been with Jesus. Because we live in a wicked world. We live in a world that is full of darkness. A world where there are those who are living in darkness. That, he's, that they don't want exposed, as Paul would refer to in Ephesians chapter 5. And as this world is in darkness, this world doing the things that they want to do, doing their own will and not God's, then those who are serving God shine as lights in the world. They stand out. If I turn on a flashlight right now, unless you look directly in it, you probably couldn't even tell it was on because the lights are in, on in this room. And it really wouldn't make much impact. But the fact that we set an example of lights of the world is because it's so dark around us that we stand out. It's like if I had that same flashlight on, but I turned all the lights off in this room. Then you could see the flashlight. Then it would stand out. We're in the minority. There are not many that will be servants of God. Most are going to do their own will. And because of that, our light can shine all the brighter when we conduct ourselves as God would have us to. When we, when we live as Christ would have us to live, then others can perceive that Christ lives in us, and we set an example for them. They can look to us as an example. 
Here in this world with all this wickedness going around and all these people wondering, what do I need to do for happiness? As Solomon did in the book of Ecclesiastes. And Solomon tried everything there. And then he perceived the answer that the world should be perceiving today. And that is, fear God and keep His commandments. But if they look to us and they realize something's different, and they investigate and realize that these are servants of God, then they may want that too. Which brings us to the second point. They may be converted. In 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, he pointed out that wives might win their husbands by their conduct. That's true uh, in the marriage relationship. That's true in any relationship. If people are close enough to us that they, they see the fact that we conduct ourselves differently, they may want to know why. It may open a door of opportunity for study. It may not be, even be study. It may be they realize why we're different and it causes them to study themselves. Maybe they decide to come to church. It may be different reasons. But they may seek out that same joy. They may seek out what it is that makes us different. And come to know the truth because of the example you set when they perceive that Christ is living in you. Just as the Sanhedrin perceived that, that Peter and John had been with Jesus. And finally, that results in them glorifying God in the day of visitation, as 1 Peter 2.12 would point out. When he said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 12, that uh, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. When others perceive that something is different, and they see that something is different, and that we're living in a manner different from the world. They seek that out. They may be converted and glorify God in the day of visitation. But they do that only if they perceive that we're living as Christ would have us live. If they perceive that Christ is living in us. Just as the Jewish leaders had perceived that they, Peter and John that is, had been with Jesus. Well maybe as we come to a close this evening that... There's one or more present that may have never responded in obedience to the gospel. And if so, as the song that we're about to sing says, Why keep Jesus waiting? You're not guaranteed of another opportunity. For what is our life but a vapor that appears for a short time and vanishes away? So if you're here and you've heard the word of God and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, may not repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism, then others may perceive that Christ is living in you when they realize something's different and the way you conduct yourselves. Maybe you're here and you've done that, but you say, somewhere along the line, I haven't conducted myself as I need to. If it's of a private nature, take it to the Lord privately in prayer. But if it's of a public nature, we will pray with you and for you, for God to forgive you. But no matter what your need is, if we can assist you in any way, we do not come forward as together we stand. And as we sing, I encourage you to be taking out your Bibles and following along this evening to test the things I have to say to see that they are by the Word of God. Hope that if we find them to be the truth and we'll take and apply them in our everyday walks of life, that we could leave here being better servants of God in the future than we have been in the past. You know, as Christians, we would all agree that God is to be the focal point of our lives. And that every decision we make ought to be focused around what is most pleasing to God. And it's that way in our relationships with those that are lost. And we should view the lost as God does. And we should desire to teach them so that they may obey the gospel. It should be that way in the way that we treat our co-workers and the way that we treat our brethren. But you know, when it comes to our relationship to God and it being the focal point of all other relationships, there are some relationships that in the world but even among brethren, that we don't always put God at the focal point as we should. But you know, God ought to be the focal point in the home. He ought to be the focal point of the marriage relationship and of the parent-child relationship. You see, every decision that is made by one as a husband or by a wife or by children or made as parents or to all come back to the central focus of God being that central point in our lives and us striving to do what is most pleasing to Him. Perhaps at some point you have heard this statement. He is a good Christian, but a sorry 
husband. Or she is a good Christian, but a sorry wife. This statement has been made before. I want to suggest to you this evening that that's simply not true. One cannot be a good Christian and not be what they ought to be in the home relationship. Peter pointed out in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 7 that one's prayers could be hindered if they weren't what they needed to be in their marriage relationship. And so we ought to strive to put God first in every aspect of our lives, including the marriage relationship and the parent-child relationship. And we ought to really come to this statement that is in a song we sometimes sing, and that statement is, God, give us Christian homes. It's a song we sing from time to time. God, give us Christian homes. Homes where the Bible is loved and taught. I want to suggest to you this evening that we should have that desire and be asking God to give us Christian homes. But let's talk about what that looks like. Let's talk about the husband responsibilities, the wife's responsibilities, the children's responsibilities, and then the responsibility of parents in the home relationship if we make this request for God to give us Christian homes. But what does that look like? As we talk about each of these relationships, the husband, the wife, the, the child, and the parent, what does that look like? Well, first of all, if we're asking God to give us Christian homes, that's a home with a husband who... First and foremost, is head over the wife. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. It's stated in the passage that was read for us as well in Colossians, but we're more familiar with Ephesians' account. When in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul, in writing to the church at Ephesus, is talking about the relationship of Christ and the church, but he uses the parallel of the marriage relationship. And here's what he said in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is, him, and is himself its Savior. So the husband is to be the head of the household. He's to be the head over the wife. But I think in our society, the idea of... And oftentimes you'll hear them talk about not having these roles. These are outdated roles. But I think we need to understand that the husband is head over the wife, but that does not mean he is a dictator. He is the head, and ultimately the decision comes to him, but he is not one that leads as a dictator, that it's his way and that's the only way it'll ever be. I think sometimes the idea of a husband being the head over the wife is misconstrued and mispainted by the world to the point that sometimes, even among Christians, we may not fully understand what that means. But the idea of the husband being the head does not mean that he's a dictator and he's like the king that says, this is what I want and this is how it's going to be done. A, a true godly man who's leading his home's motto is not my way or the highway. His idea is to lead and lead out of love and lead out of concern for those he is leading. He is the head of the wife. But he takes into consideration her thoughts and her feelings as a leader. Nobody can be a truthfully effective leader if those following them aren't willing to follow. They may get done what they want to get done, but it doesn't make them a good leader. It makes them a good dictator. If one just simply has it done as they want to have it done, and so everybody follows because they don't want to displease. But now an effective leader that leads out of love leads with the care and concerns of the ones they lead. And a husband that is truthfully a good leader and a good head of his household is one who leads out of love. Which brings us to the next point, that he is to love his wife. And if two points are made about this love that the husband is to have. The first of those is, this love is as Christ loved the church. Look at Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You know, this is a sacrificial kind of love. This is the kind of love that is willing to do what is necessary for the sake of the other. The time may never come 
in which a man may actually have to give his life for his wife as Christ gave himself for the church. He may not have to actually sacrifice his own life for her. But he can exemplify the love of Christ by leading and loving in a way that shows the sacrificial nature of his love. As far as it is concerned, if it comes down to his way or her way and there needs to be compromised, this kind of love demands that he's willing to make the sacrifice of his own wants for the sake of hers. It's the kind of love that makes a sacrifice and says that it'll do what is in best interest of the other party and not themselves. That exemplifies the sacrificial love of Christ. Because Christ loved him so much, he gave his own life for us. Then, we should, then, then husbands should love their wives so much that they will sacrifice their own wants and desires for the sake of the wife as long as it does not compromise the truth. But not only is the love the reflection of the love of Christ, he loves his wife as he loves his own self. In the same way, verse 28 of Ephesians 5, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. He loves her as he loves himself. For in fact, they are one flesh, as verse 31 pointed out. I believe it was Matthew, the commentator Matthew Henry who said, A man's children are pieces of himself. A man's wife is himself. And that ultimately comes back to the two shall become one flesh, which I think has far more to do than just the sexual relationship, but the blending of two lives into one. But the fact is, he loves her as himself, for as a matter of fact, she is, his, she is himself. The two are one. And so he loves and cares for her and shows her the same concern he would give towards himself. Which brings us to the next point, which is closely connected to that. He will nourish and cherish her. Look at verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. He nourishes and cherishes her. He provides for her needs. He provides the things that she needs. He takes care of her. That's what it means for him to nourish and cherish her. Just as he would provide the daily essentials for himself because he loves his own flesh. Just as he would make sure that he has the things necessary for himself to survive and be protected, he does the same thing for his Wife. That's what it means for him to nourish and cherish. He will take care of her. But you know, he doesn't just, he's not just the head, and he doesn't just love his wife and nourish and cherish her. He dwells with her with understanding. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. If a husband is going to be the kind of man he needs to be in the household, if he's going to be the kind of man that you would see in a Christian home, he needs to dwell with her with understanding. Likewise, 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as to the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. He needs to be dwelling with her with understanding. Does it take a degree in science to tell you this, but men and women are different. I know in our society today that the picture is not painted that they don't want to blur the lines, but the fact is men and women are different. They think differently. His needs are not her needs, and her needs are not his needs. There was a book written years ago, I believe it was by a Dr. Harley that wrote the book, entitled His Needs, Her Needs. And the book points out about the basic needs in the relationship, the ten most basic needs, and he makes a good point that the, the five most important needs to the man are not the same as the five most important to the woman. Well, if, if a man is to dwell with his wife with understanding, he needs to understand that he thinks differently than she does. That he is different than she is. And his needs are not her needs. They are different. You know, if he tries to fulfill what is his needs, but he doesn't dwell with her with understanding and understand the fact that what she wants and needs is different than what he wants and needs, 
that he's never going to satisfy the needs that she has. You see, he needs to dwell with understanding. What he needs to do is understand that men and women are different. And what he needs to do to love and care for her and fulfill her needs is different than what he needs to be shown in love and care and for his own needs. And so he dwells with her with understanding and he gives honor to her. Both as to the weaker vessel and as heirs together as will be pointed out in 1 Peter 3 and in verse 7. He shows honor to his wife. I want to suggest to you that in the marriage relationship, when both parties are, when one party is fulfilling their roles, it makes it easier for the other party to fulfill their roles. And we will get in a moment and talk about what it look what the uh, the Christian home, what the wife would look like in a Christian home. But before we talk about what the wife looks like, let's understand it is easier for the wife to fulfill her role when the husband shows her honor. When he lets her know how much he appreciates the role that she fills in the home. I said a second ago that men and women are different. And being such, the roles and responsibilities in the home are different. And because the roles and responsibilities in the home are different, then what she may do provides something different than what he does in the home. And even though... That she, she may not always view what she does as important as what he does. He needs to let her know how important her role is. And then we'll talk in a second about the flip side of that when we get to the wall. But he needs to give honor to her. Let her know her worth and how much she provides in the marriage relationship. If you remember in Proverbs chapter 31. In Proverbs chapter 31. In what we refer to as what is referred to as the virtuous woman of Proverbs chapter 31, it talks about the worth of the virtuous woman. When in Proverbs chapter 31, it pointed out that an excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels, verse 10. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. It talks about her worth being far above that of jewels. In verse 28 it says, Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. He lets her know how valuable she is in the marriage relationship. And if the home is going to be the Christian home, then it needs to have a husband who's the head. A husband who loves his wife both as Christ loved the church and as his own body. Who will nourish and cherish her, that is, he provides for her needs. He dwells with her with understanding and he gives honor to her. God give us Christian homes. We've seen what that looks like from the husband's standpoint. But God give us Christian homes. That's a home with a wife who, first and foremost, submits to her husband. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 22, as well as 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, it points out that it is necessary of uh, uh, the importance of submission. 1 Peter 3, 1 said, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if you do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. We'll come back and talk in, ju in, in just a moment about that, that part of it again, but let's, let's understand here the importance of this submission. It's pointed out in Ephesians 5.22 that wives are to submit to their own husbands as to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5. They submit as to the Lord. And in verse 24 of Ephesians chapter 5, that they are to be subject in everything. I think sometimes, as a note, that, that it's often thought that the wife is to be submissive and the husband the leader when it comes to spiritual things. And he does need to be the leader as it comes to spiritual things. But it's by, he's a leader and by far more than that. And I think no passage better illustrates that than 1 Peter chapter 3. First, Ephesians 5 verse 24 said to be subject in everything. But go back to 1 Peter 3 if you've turned from that. 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice what he said in verses 1 and 2. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word... They may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see a respectful and pure conduct. If he's a leader only in spiritual things, she's following one who's not even a Christian. 
She's a Christian who's living her life as she ought, but she's still to be subject to her husband, even if he doesn't obey the word. As long as it doesn't come in conflict with God's word. If something happens to where you know, he tells her she shouldn't go to services, then she still needs to go to services. Her responsibility to God is first and foremost. But in terms of him being the leader of the home, she will follow his leadership and be submissive, even if he is not a Christian. In fact, by doing so, she may win him by her conduct. By the conduct described as chaste or respectful and pure. By the way that she lives her life, even if he's not a Christian, 1 Peter 3 points out, then he may obey the gospel as he observes her conduct. And her being what she ought, even in the marriage, in the marriage relationship, even if he isn't what he needs to be, she might win him by her conduct. So even if he is not a Christian, she is still to be submissive. But not only is she to be submissive uh, as to the Lord and its subject and everything, and even if they don't obey the word, submission is the proper adornment for a woman. Look at verses 3 through 6 of 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3, 3 through 6. Do not let your adorning be merely external. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So here's what he's told them in verse here, here in this section. He said in verse 4 that what they're to be adorned with is the hidden person of the heart. He said, let the adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight is very precious. Be adorned with the hidden person of the heart. He then comes down in verse 5 and said that this is how the women of old were adorned. Look at verse 5. For this is how the holy women who hope in God used to adorn themselves. They were adorned with the hidden person of the heart. Not the external, not, not merely external, not the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing they wore, but it was they were adorned with the hidden person of the heart, and they did this by being submissive. Look at verse 5 again. For this is how the holy women of old, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. So he said, you need to be adorned with... With this, with this hidden person of the heart. You can do that, or this is exactly how women of old were adorned, and they were adorned that way by being submissive to their own husbands. And here in verse 6, here's an example of someone who was that way, and that is Sarah, who called Abraham Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. What he tells them in these verses is, a woman can be properly clothed or adorned by being submissive. Yes, she may win the, her husband by her conduct, verses 1 and 2. But even if she doesn't win him, she is adorned how she ought with that hidden person of the heart, that incorruptible or imperishable beauty that he described in verse 4. And that's done by being submissive. But not only that, being submissive shows a trust in God. In verse 5, he said that it was how holy women of old who, who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. It's how the women of old were adorned was by this. It shows the hope and a trust in God by one who is submissive to their own husband and trying to be properly adorned because they're concerned with their faith in God. And that's what he's showing here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verses 1 through verse 6. So women are to be submissive to their husbands as to the Lord, subject in everything. But not only is there the responsibility to be submissive, she needs to see that she respects her husband. In Ephesians chapter 5, in Ephesians chapter 5, and in verse 33, it said, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I said earlier, it is easier for the wife to fulfill her role 
if she understands how much the husband appreciates the role she fulfills and shows her honor. On the flip side of that, he, it, is, it makes it easier for him to fulfill his role and understand the significance of his role when she shows him respect. It's a two-way street, and when both are going, are working together and doing their part, it makes the marriage relationship that much easier. It makes the marriage relationship more ple or pleasing in the sight of God when they're conducting themselves as they ought. And when he shows her honor and she shows him respect, it makes fulfilling their roles easier because they know the value in fulfilling each one of their roles and what it provides in the home. She needs to show him respect. She needs to love him. Titus chapter 2 and in verse 4, she needs to love her husband and love her children. This is a different word for love than the word that we had earlier in Ephesians. The word found in Ephesians chapter, in Ephesians chapter 5 concerning the love of husband is the word agapeo or agape. It's the word we often think of when it comes to love. Uh, for example... In 1 John chapter 4 and in verse 7, God is love, that's agape kind of love. And that is the foundation of the marriage relationship, is this agape kind of love. It's the foundation of all relationships. It's the kind of love we show our enemies. It's the kind of love that will be sacrificial in nature. And, that, and she needs to have an agape kind of love towards him, and he needs to have it towards her, as we saw in Ephesians 5. But this suggests that there is more than just this this kind of love in the marriage relationship, as the love of Titus chapter 2 and in verse 4 has more to do with the love of affection. Which tells us there is more involved in the love of the marriage relationship than just the agape kind of love. It's part of what makes the marriage relationship different from other relationships. And yes, she does need to ask for him the agape kind of love, but she needs to have the love of affection, as Titus chapter 2 and in verse 4 would point out, for her husband. And then she needs to be a worker at home. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home. Kind and submissive to their own husbands. She needs to fulfill her responsibilities and roles as a homemaker, as some translations would say. And if she fulfills those responsibilities as a homemaker, then she is pleasing in the sight of God and it does what is pleasing in His sight and what He would have her to do. And if she's submissive, and she shows respect to her husband, and she loves him, and she's the keeper at home, then she fulfills her role as she ought. And as we say, God give us Christian homes. The responsibility of the husband is fulfilled. The responsibility of the wife is fulfilled. But you know, we say, God give us Christian homes. We sing the song sometimes, God give us Christian homes. We saw what that requires out of the husband. We've seen what it requires out of the wife. Let's talk now about God give us Christian homes. That's homes with children who, first and foremost, are obedient to parents. In Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 1. In Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The obedience of Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 1, this is them following what their parents would tell them today, listening to their parents. And we said earlier that sometimes you hear people say that that is a good Christian man, but he's not a good husband or a good Christian woman, and she's not a, but she's, not a, 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 she's a sorry wife. Well, the same thing can be true in the relationship when it comes to children. Children need to be obedient to their parents from a young age. But as children especially grow older and, and obey the gospel, their salvation can depend on their obedience to parents. If a child has reached the age of accountability and responded in obedience to the gospel, yet they're not willing to listen to and obey their parents, it can affect their salvation. In fact, if they're not obedient to parents and show their parents respect, then what, what does that mean when it comes to obeying and showing respect to their heavenly Father if they will not do so to their earthly Father? It is entirely possible for one to reach the age of accountability and be lost because they're not obedient to parents. And children have that responsibility of being obedient. 
And that responsibility lasts as the child is in their parents' home and growing up. I think we need to understand something else about a Christian home because we know about the importance of obedience uh, by children, but we need to understand the importance of children who honor their parents. In Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 2 it said, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Obedience is confined, a child being obedient to their parents is confined at the time that the child is within that household. Honor is something that is to be done all the days of the children's life. It's not on the board, but turn to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus is, is debating with the, with the religious leaders of the day. It's they're questioning His apostles who ate with unwashed hands. And what they in reality were doing was binding a tradition of man. And even more so, binding the tradition of man over the command of God. That's where, it, we're probably more familiar with Matthew 15 and the parallel account. But that's where Isaiah 29, 13 is quoted. These people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. But picking up at Mark 7 and in verse 8, I want you to notice what Jesus said. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you, are fine, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Listen to verse 10. Listen to what command they set aside that he talks about. For Moses said... Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. Now those that he's talking to are the religious leaders of the day. Those who are adults, these are the ones that are supposed to be teaching the other people. These are those who would no longer be in their parents' home. I show you this to suggest to you that it requires far, that, that honor goes far beyond the days of living in one uh, of a child living in their parents' household. It's something, he says here, they still should have been showing to their parents. They needed to be showing them honor. Honor, verse 10, your father and mother. And whoever reviles father and mother shall surely die. So they need to be showing honor or respect to their parents all the days of their life. But it's not just this honor or respect that is shown. The word honor also carries with it the idea of material value. Look down in the verses that follow. Verse 11. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you have gained for me is Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. See, in verse, six, he said, or verse 11, he said, you would have a man that sets aside the commandment and doesn't honor father and mother. You say... That whatever I would give to you is Corbin. That is, it's given to God. You're not... That is, this is something of material value. Here's what I think this shows us. Now, there is honor in the sense of respect that needs to be shown. Children need to show respect to their parents in the household and as they grow older. But it's not just the respect... As again, I said, this word honor carries with it the idea of the material value. This means, too, taking care of one's parents. You see, he said, if a man tells his father and mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God, or as an offering. And so, this is taken care of. The time may come where the parents get older and need to be taken care of. Just as the child needed someone to raise them, now the parents need somebody to love and care for them. And part of honor is taking care of the, one's parents. Now they can be in many different forms. Maybe they live with the child and the child takes care of them. Maybe the child makes sure that they, get, they put them in a facility that gives them the care they need. There are many forms in which that can take. But it means that the child sees to it that the parent is taken care of. They show them honor. And so the children in a Christian home need to be obedient to their parents. When they are under their parents' roof, and even when they grow older, they still need to be showing honor to their parents. 
God give his Christian homes. That's homes with a husband who leads, homes with a husband who loves, who nourishes and cherishes his wife, who dwells with her with understanding and gives honor to her. That's homes with a wife who's submissive, who loves her husband, who respects her husband, and is a homemaker. That's homes with children who are obedient and show honor. And God give us Christian homes. That's homes with parents who, first and foremost, do not provoke their children to anger. Go to Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 4. After giving the instructions in verses 1 through 3 concerning children, in verse 4 it said, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Colossians chapter 3, in the passage that was read for us earlier in the scripture reading, says, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. See, if one provokes their children to anger, they can become discouraged. They, they may get frustrated and give up. Well, the question then becomes raised, how can one provoke their children to anger? Well, this can be done in multiple ways, many ways, but here's an example of just a few. It may be by setting a different standard from one child to the next, that that may frustrate or provoke to anger the children. If one child feels that they are held to a different standard than another, they may become angry. It may be if they are inconsistently disciplined. One time they do something and get away with it, and the next time they do the same thing and they get in trouble and they don't know what they're going to do. It may be by not offering them encouragement, but only tearing them down instead of sometimes giving positive reinforcement and letting them know they're doing good before letting them know where they can do better. Those are just a few examples, and there are many other ways in which a child can be provoked to anger by the parents. But the responsibility of parents is not to provoke their children to anger, but instead to raise them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the, in, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Is the English Standard Version, and some others render it there, that it is discipline and instruction. The idea rendered, the word rendered discipline out of the Greek has to do with anything pertaining to the raising of children. Anything to do with the raising of children. In fact, some other passages, or the New King James and other translations would record in verse 4 to bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. But as this has to do with anything, it includes, and we'll talk about this more in a second, it includes discipline. The word rendered training in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 in the New King James is rendered chastening. Four, I think it's four or five times in Hebrews chapter 12. When in Hebrews 12, it talks about earthly fathers chasing their children, and our heavenly father chastens us. It's the same word rendered training or discipline in Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 4. But they bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That means they teach them what they need to know. Remember in Proverbs 22 and in verse 6, in Proverbs 22 and in verse 6, it said to train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Teach them what they need to know. Raise them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Teach them about the love of God and the love of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ. Teach them about what they need to do to be faithful servants of God. Teach them what they need, how they need to conduct themselves in this wicked world. And as you teach them and instruct them in the Word of God, then it may be, as Proverbs 22, 6 points out, that if you train them as the way they shall go, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now, I know that's a general rule. There are exceptions to that rule. But it is a general rule, and oftentimes is, more, is true more often than not. If you teach them what they need to know when they are younger, they are more likely to be faithful as they get older. And then... Discipline them. Proverbs 13.24 points out that sparing the rod is hating the child. Now Solomon in the book of Proverbs oftentimes talks about parents disciplining their children. And in Proverbs chapter 13, and in Proverbs 13 and in verse 
24, he wrote, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Or it could mean instead of diligent to discipline him, he who loves him disciplines him early. They teach them right from wrong and discipline them. Discipline requires both the rod and reproof to give wisdom. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29 and in verse 15. The rod and reproof gives wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. You know, Proverbs 29, 15, as it mentions the rod and reproof, it brings into two different, very important aspects of discipline. There is the rod. That's what we often refer to as the spankings. That's, that's where as they get older, you ground them. But then there is reproof. That is the instruction. You can spank a child when they're little, but if you don't tell them what they did wrong, they're not going to know why, what, what, they're not going to know why they're being disciplined. On the flip side of that, if you tell them what they did wrong, but there's never any consequence to it, then it's not going to bring wisdom. It's the two together. It's the rod, the discipline, and it's the reproof, the instruction. And the two together bring wisdom. In fact, uh, Proverbs 23 points out, this discipline is not going to kill them. In Proverbs 23, Proverbs chapter 23, and in verse 13, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. I remember when I was younger, and I remember watching my siblings as they were younger. Sometimes children think they're going to die when they get a spanking. But the child will not die, not with discipline. In fact, it instead drives folly from their heart. Proverbs 22 and in verse 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Uh, sometimes, as we look out at the world among us, the question often gets raised, why is, why is the world so wicked? Why is it that, 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 that the world is so wicked in living the way that they are? Oh, I think there are a lot of answers. I think one of them boils down to this. There are a lot of children in the world today who were not disciplined as children. Or a lot of adults in the world today, rather, who were not disciplined as children. And because they were never shown the rod and reproof, the folly was never driven from their hearts. And that's why the world we live in today is so wicked, because of the fact that over the last many years, discipline has become less and less common. And so because of that, there are many adults with the folly of a child still bound up in their heart. But you can drive it away with discipline, as the proverb writer points out in Proverbs 22 and in verse 15. And when that's done, in correlation with everything else we've seen, then we can have that Christian home as we often sing and ask, for God give us Christian homes. We can have the, the, the marriage relationship and the parent-child relationship that is most pleasing to God. If we follow these instructions, the husband who's the head, who loves his wife as Christ loved the church and as himself, who nourishes and cherishes her, who shows her honor and dwells with understanding, the wife who submits, the wife who respects and loves her husband and is a homemaker, the child who obeys and honors, the parent who does not provoke to anger, but instead instructs and disciplines. And then we can have Christian homes. But as we come to the close of the sermon this evening, it may be that there is one or more present who may have never responded in obedience to the gospel. You're not guaranteed another opportunity for what is life but a vapor that appears for a short time and vanishes away. So if you're here and you've heard the word of God and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, May not repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism, to rise and walk in the newness of life, knowing that there's a great day coming as we're fixing to sing in the invitation song. And when that day comes, you can have a reward, and it'll be a great day if you're a servant of His. But if you're here, and if you're here and you've uh, done that, but somewhere along the line you've fallen away, then it's a sad day, just as it is for the alien sinner. But there's good news. There's that second law of pardon. If it's of a private nature, take it to the Lord in, in, a private, uh, in, in prayer. But if it's of a public nature, if you'll repent of it and confess your sins, then we will pray with you and for you for God to forgive you. But no matter your need, if we can assist you in any way, would you not come forward together we stand as we say.